We are in section 1.5, Elements of System Level Troubleshooting. The ability to diagnose and correct is an important part of having a career in computer technology or electronics in general. We're going to be looking at some of the strategies used in troubleshooting, and these strategies include uh, block diagram thinking, signal tracing, signal injection, diagnostic software, observation, and substitution. The first one we'll look at is block diagram thinking. And troubleshooting complex electronic systems can be an overwhelming task. Many systems are too complex to be able to visualize all of the system details. Uh, one way to avoid being overwhelmed is to logically troubleshoot the system from, from a block diagram perspective. And we, earlier in this chapter, we had looked at uh, block diagrams and we had observed that block diagrams just gave us the big picture of a system and didn't give us the detail. And this is often helpful when trying to diagnose a problem in a large system because you don't want all that much detail. You actually get lost in the detail, so you want a bigger picture which a block diagram can provide. The next troubleshooting technique we'll mention is signal tracing. Signal tracing. It's a technique that involves monitoring circuit quantities at various points throughout the circuit. At each point you evaluate whether the measurement is good or bad with respect to the correct or measured value. Typically, oscilloscopes or voltmeters are used to do this. And one of the uh, important or, or necessary skills in, in this is that you actually know what is the value that should be measured at given points. And usually, uh, with given systems, you'll have technical manuals or schematics that will provide that information. By tracing the signal through the system, particularly sequential systems, you will reach a point where the signal is no longer what it should be. And at that point, you determine, well, this is probably where uh, the fault is. One way to implement signal tracing is called divide and conquer. And in this strategy, measurements are made at the middle of the system. And I guess if I, I can draw a very really basic, let's just, just pretend that here we have a given system and a signal comes in here and the signal comes out over here. And let's pretend that we have test points throughout this circuit and we can go in and we could, you know, we could measure every single one of these test points to determine when does the system fail. Or we could just go in and say, well, let's measure right here. And we make a determination, is that a good signal or is it a bad signal? And again, you have to know you have to be familiar enough with the system to determine is that a good signal or is it a bad. Well, if it's a good signal, then you know the problem is over here. So you probably divide and conquer again and make a determination. And is, is it here or is it here? And so that's the, the concept of uh, divide and conquer uh, utilizing uh, signal tracing. Then diagnostic software. Diagnostic, diagnostic software is a powerful tool in the troubleshooting endeavor. This specially designed software requires only limited system capability in order to execute successfully. Diagnostic software is common in troubleshooting notice for uh, computer systems, uh, memory, and hardware error, errors. And a couple of the diagnostic software programs I'm familiar with are Norton Utilities, uh, SciSoft, Sandra. In fact, SciSoft Sandra you can get it as a free download, and it's an interesting program that you're uh, using it to diagnose uh, computer system faults. Diagnostic software-based systems are also used in the uh, in automotive troubleshooting. Observation. The most important tool in your troubleshooting toolkit is the power of observation. And 
And when we say um, observation, this is this is all of the senses. You know, you can, you know, you can see, uh, but you can also uh, you can also smell, and you can also hear. And oftentimes in diagnosing electronic systems, it isn't just what you see. Sometimes it's what you smell that tells you a lot. Some of those of you that have been around uh, this business know that there's just that smell of burning components that tells you something is very wrong. Uh, sometimes even you'll hear sounds that shouldn't be there. But anyway, observation is very important in uh, diagnosing faults. Many defects can be diagnosed simply by carefully observe, observing the operation of a circuit. Observation extends to three other important troubleshooting strategies. Okay, besides uh, specific observing, there is the user interview. And here, what, what has the user observed about the circuit? Um, then there's a concept I hadn't heard. Uh, I, I, this particular term, front panel milking, is not one that, that I had heard of before, but this is the way your, t your text describes it. And what it is is the intentional operation of all of the front panel controls while observing the behavior of the system. And this just simply means that you're putting a given system through all of its paces and uh, adjusting it and, and doing all the things that this system should be able to do and observing its operation. And again, this is only going to be helpful if you know how that system is supposed to operate. If you know how it's supposed to operate and then you notice something that's not quite right, as a technician, you'll be able to pick that up. But if you do not know the correct uh, operation of a given system, this may or may not help. Then uh, review of history using logbooks. Uh, logbooks can be of great value if they are maintained. Um, oftentimes, um, if, a, if a group of technicians maintains logs of the systems they're troubleshooting, oftentimes they can diagnose um, weaknesses in the system. And then when it comes to a, a, a fault that comes up, they can look in their log books and say, oh, that particular fault has been occurring frequently. And rather than do a, you know, that they can just go directly to the fault based on documentation. Uh, substitution, um, benefits and risks, and well, let's first, what is substitution? Once localized, the, sus the suspected component can be substituted and the circuit evaluated again, again to verify the component operation. Well, substitution, well, let's, let's pretend that here we've got a, um, let's just pretend this is a uh, radio. And we'll pretend that this is a, here we've got a radio here, and this one is bad, it doesn't work. And so here we have um, uh, another radio, and this one is good. And this is the, the technician has this uh, available, and so this radio has come in and he's supposed to repair it. Now, typically, uh, and if, when we're talking about a this is probably a communication system, maybe a, a communication systems for an aircraft or something. It's probably a high-end device. And most radios are going to have, and we'll, I'll, I'll draw some lines here, and we'll pretend that these are uh, the circuit cards or modules within uh, this bad radio. Now, in the substitution method of troubleshooting, what the technician would do is that he would simply uh, pull out, you know, here we have a, a circuit card one, and, and he would take out circuit card one and replace it. And if that fixed it, you know, he knows that. But typically, you would replace several before you got to the one that was the faulty one. Now let's pretend, just for sake of discussion, we'll pretend that uh, he determines that circuit card number four uh, was the faulty component. And so he would probably go over to his uh, supply system and he would uh, order circuit card number four. He would put it into the radio and the radio is fixed. And this is the, the concept of, of troubleshooting by the method of substitution when you have a, a group of known good components. Substitution can be used at nearly any level in system integration, in the system integration. Um, 
in aviation, when a system fails, the entire system is often removed and replaced. And so we're going to look at in, in, in aviation as an example. We talked about that box in the previous screen. Let's pretend that uh, in this particular aircraft, the radio system has failed. The pilot can't talk to ground, and he just landed, and uh, he's got to take off soon, and he can't wait for technicians to fix this thing. So what they would do is they would just, and this would be major substitution, they would just take this entire black box out and take a known good black box, plug it in, and the radio works, and the pilot flies away. Well, the uh, bad box now is going to go down to the folks in maintenance, and maintenance are going, the technicians are going to have to fix this thing. So the technicians take the black box apart, remove and replace modules until the box is fixed. And so they would be doing the process that we had looked at over here, uh, substituting modules until they uh, repair the box. When repaired, the, the radio goes back to the supply system until it's needed by another aircraft. So in this case, um, this box, now that it's fixed, it goes into the uh, uh, supply system and it waits until another radio fails and then it's plugged into an aircraft and away it goes. Uh, in this particular cycle here, the, the defective modules are then repaired by the maintenance personnel and this would typically involve going down to the uh, component level and repairing the faulty circuit card and this would this would there's no substitution here but in these two upper levels of the maintenance cycle uh, substitution is a very viable way of repairing uh, systems. Substitution is not always practical as the primary method of troubleshooting as it requires notice a tremendous inventory of spare parts in complex systems. Now in the aviation industry there's this, there's this, you know, there's lots of revenues there and there is um, uh, just a need to be able to make aircraft go immediately and so typically the supply systems will be able to support that but in uh, smaller systems um, that probably isn't always an op, uh, you know, a, a, that type of inventory wouldn't always be available. So in that case, substitution will not always be a viable alternative. Occasionally, uh, and, this, and this is another problem with substitution, occasionally system chassis will short damaging connected modules. And as known good modules are plugged into the system, it destroys them as well. And uh, I'm just thinking of an example. For example, uh, most cars today have an onboard computer and occasionally the onboard computer will fail. And so the technician goes out and thinks, oh, the onboard computer failed. I'll just replace it. So he replaces it only to have the one he replaced go up in smoke as well. Well, the problem probably is that uh, there is something in the chassis of that vehicle that is shorting out the onboard computer. And so that the, the, the original problem wasn't the onboard computer, it was a short in the chassis connected to the onboard computer. And so now he's got two broken computers. So uh, substitution doesn't always work. And it requires experience and good judgment on the part of the technician to be able to determine when substitution is going to work and uh, when it is not going to work. So this is, uh, we have in section 1.5, we've addressed the elements of system level troubleshooting and we looked at uh, substitution. We have looked at observation. Remember your senses can tell you a lot about troubleshooting. We've looked at diagnostic software used primarily in compute, but it is, it is used also in the automotive industry. A number of, uh, lots of industries now use diagnostic software to troubleshoot uh, electronic systems. Uh, signal tracing, uh, block diagram thinking. So that concludes elements of system level troubleshooting, section 1.5.